Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the latest <laughs> edition of Master Naturalist Presents. My name is Mel. My name is Matt. And we're, we're here from the Central Library to bring you this monthly series featuring the nature expertise of the North Texas Master Naturalists, which are a local chapter of a statewide Texas Master Naturalist program. And today's program is gonna be led by Janet Smith. So Janet is a self-described recovering plantaholic who considers the master naturalist, master garden, and native landscape certificate trainings as her 12-step program. She now has a special interest in native plants and restricts her selections to heat and drought tolerant plants that multitask by attracting pollinators like butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds, as well as lizards and other inter interesting insects besides pollinators. Janet has enjoyed doing hundreds of nature and garden presentations since 2006. She's also logged over a thousand volunteer hours of North Texas Master, Natu Ma North Texas Master Service and over 5,000 hours of Master Gardener Service. And before turning it over to Janet, I'll mention that the recording for today's program will be posted in a few days on the YouTube playlist for the Master Naturalist Present series. And I'll post a link to that playlist in the chat later on. So with that said, I think I'll turn it over to Janet. Welcome, Janet. Thank you, Melanie. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here again. Um, we're gonna talk about pollinators. And I just wanna let you know that up until about 17 years ago, I was your average person who knew there was a lot in nature and I thought I knew a lot about nature, but I've come to realize I didn't know anything. And so all my talks are given with that in mind that my, I think my role is to tell people who aren't aware of what's going on, what's really happening around them and hope that they become more observant and more appreciative of what it takes to make our life worth living. And we need all these creatures to help. So as mentioned, I'm a North Texas master naturalist and we are a core of well-informed volunteers who want to educate the public about taking good care of nature and so that generations in the future can enjoy it. So most people like to look at flowers, but plants produce flowers only for one purpose, and it's not to entertain or amuse human beings. It is to help themselves reproduce. The basic driving force of all plants and creatures is to reproduce. And the way plants do that is through flowers and they need help. And those are the pollinators. So most flowers are like 75% of the plants have flowers to aid them in reproduction. And most of them have visible sexual organs. And you've all seen them if you've looked up close at plants. Um, here on the left is an amaryllis. One might be growing in your yard. They're past their blooming season now. But um, they're a very popular plant to start at home around Christmas. And you'll see them in all the retail outlets. And you might have one each year or your mother or another relative might. It's a typical winter um, plant and you can see the sex organs there on the left. The yellow ones are the anthers and the white one is the stigma. The anthers are the male organ and the stigma is the female. Over here on the right, the yellow flower is a hibiscus, which is not a native flower to here. Most of them are not. There are some that are, but they are a very popular summer plant in our area, you know, 
the big box stores will be full of them. They're very inexpensive to buy. So they're very popular and they're beautiful flowers. And there's their sex organs just there for the world to see. There's no way you can look at these flowers and not notice their sex organs. And the flowers put themselves out there like that to make it easy for the pollinators to help them reproduce. So some plants have just one set of sexual organs. They're unisexual. There might be a male plant. There will be a male plant and a female plant. And these are some of them that you might be uh, familiar with. Many of our big trees are single sex plants. And especially the cottonwoods, this time of year, usually in June, is when we see a lot of um, what turned out of their cottonwood seeds blowing in the wind. And I live over by White Rock Lake and I remember times being at the intersection of Buckner and Northwest Highway, which is a big intersection. And I actually had to put my windshield wipers on to keep it from being covered with cottonwood seeds. A lot of people have allergies this time of year and they think they're allergic to cottonwood. But in reality, that's probably not their problem because these are cottonwood seeds and very few people are allergic to seeds. Most people are allergic to pollen of one sort or another. And that is all also in the air the same time of year from many other trees. So don't blame your sneezing on the cottonwood. They're not to blame in June. But you know, this is a varied list of plants from uh, vegetables, nuts, fruits, hallucinogenics. I'm not suggesting you grow all these. I'm just listing them to let you know. These, you will have to have a male plant <clears throat> and a female plant in order for them to have reproduction. Some plants, have flowers that are male and flowers that are female. And these are the ones, different plants have different genders. So here's the squash flowers. You see the male is on the left and the female is on the right. And that green part below the yellow bloom is the ovary. And that's where the seeds are gonna grow. So if you see that, you know it's either a female plant or it is a bisexual plant that has both genders. And here, when you look at the flowers, you can see the difference. And you know, most humans, I think, looking at these would figure out that the one on the left is the male and the one on the right is the female. So there are pollinators and there are pollinizers. Pollinators are the agent that carries pollen from one plant to another. And this is usually animals for most plants. It can also be the wind or it can be water. And many plants are self-pollinizing, especially grasses and plants that have very insignificant or no visible flowers usually are self-pollinators. Pollinizers are the plants that provide pollen and not every plant provides pollen. Some only provide nectar and some provide pollen without any nectar. So the most common pollinator is our bees. And many people, that's what they think of, that the, that's the only animal that um, provides that service. But in reality, there are over 200,000 species of animals that can help in pollination. And humans are among those. 
Um, most of, there are a lot of insects involved in pollination, birds, you know, there's a reason we call sex lessons the birds and the bees, because they are very involved in that. Um, butterflies as well, um, bats, just, you know, your animals, four-legged animals walking through a garden could transport pollen from one flower to another. And all of these have no, most they have no idea that they're doing this. When humans pollinate plants, a lot of times that's done deliberately. So we're aware we're doing it, but we can do it accidentally as well. But none of these animals that are collecting pollen and spreading it are really tuned into the fact that they're helping these flowers reproduce. That's not a part of their agenda but it's a lucky break for the plants and the plants take big advantage of it. So here we've got a Mexican long-nosed bat. Some people think this is a cute little animal. Some people just make a horrible face when I show this slide when I'm doing a live presentation. But I'll let you know, that if you like to drink one of these, and yes, that's a margarita, you better love these bats because they are the exclusive pollinator of the agaves that produce tequila. So bats are very important pollinators, especially in the tropics. <laughs> They're also huge consumers of insects including mosquitoes and a lot of insects that are detrimental to crops. So bats are very useful in many ways and have many values to humans. So here we've got a church cap flower. And on the left, we've got a hummingbird. They just love these church caps. And on the right, we've got a honeybee, rear-ending a bumblebee. And to them, this was a non-event. The bumblebee didn't turn around and give an ugly gesture to the smaller bee or anything. They both went about their business. But look at how these animals interface with this plant. And which one do you think is actually helping the plant? to reproduce by pollinating it. Well, hopefully you guessed the hummingbird because you can see here, and this is a male ruby-throated hummingbird, his forehead lines up exactly with the sex organs of this flower that are way above the nectar source, which is at the bottom of the little cup-shaped flower. And these flowers are very small, you know, they're the size of fingernail. But hummingbirds have that long bill and their tongue is that long again. So they can get way to the bottom of plants, of flowers, and sip the nectar. And here you can see that this hummingbird appears to have some pollen on its forehead. So hopefully when he goes to the next plant, when he flies in, he might rub that against the stigma, which is the very top of the plant there. It's actually a little bit above his forehead in this picture. Over here with the bees, we've got the bumblebee, the big burly one, can sit outside the flower and sip the nectar because it has a long proboscis, which is its drinking body part. The smaller bees, however, have very short proboscis, so they have to actually climb into the flower in order to get the nectar. And none of these insects is touching the sex organs, so they're not helping the plant reproduce. but they are getting some needed food. 
So this kind of sums up what pollination is. So we want somebody, some animal to go to one flower, pick up some pollen, go to another flower, deposit that pollen, and then the plants are happy because they're on the road to reproduction. So pollinators are our partners because they're responsible for the production of a third of our food, half of our fats and oils. And you know, nowadays we prefer um, vegetable oils to animal oils. If you're in my age group, you remember growing up with a canister on the kitchen counter that said grease. Whenever your mother cooked bacon, she'd pour it into that canister and store it up for cooking uh, at other times. But nowadays we don't do that. We get our cooking oil in bottles because it's vegetable oil. Lots of the ingredients in our medicines and supplements. The rain, tropical rainforests are a huge source of medicines, ingredients in our prescriptions. And of course, a lot of the fibers for our clothing. So without the pollinators, we'd be in big trouble. So we need to do everything we can to help them. So how do flowers entice pollinators? You know some of these answers. Three of them are color and scent, and they offer adult beverages. And by adult beverages, I mean for the adult final stage of insects. Okay, I'm having a little problem here. It's not advancing like it should. Okay, so advertising with color. Bees are particularly attracted to blue, yellow, purple, and ultraviolet. Of course, we can see blue, yellow, and purple, but human eyes cannot see ultraviolet without a black light. And this means that these are the colors that will attract bees to the area. It doesn't mean these are the only colors flower that bees will go to. Hummingbirds love red, orange, and purple red. So things in the red spectrum. And if you feed the hummingbirds with your own nectar, which is sugar water, just a mixture of um, one fourth sugar to four parts water. Um, you usually have it in a, a feeder that has red on it. And that's why the feeder is red because red is a big attractant to hummingbirds. And full disclosure, I used to work at a wild bird store and one day a lady came in and said, you know, she didn't have any kind of bird feeders. She didn't have flowers in her yard. She didn't have a lot of trees nearby or anything. She lived in a new area. And she went to the dollar store and bought one of those red plastic tablecloths. She laid it out in her yard and just put a saucer of sugar water that she made up in the middle of it. And within an hour, she had hummingbirds coming to get a drink. So they are strongly attracted to the red color spectrum. They will then check out the other flowers in the area and could drink from them as well. If you have a hummingbird feeder, many of them have the, the ports where the hummingbirds can put their um, bill and tongue in to get the nectar. Many of those are yellow. And you can see here, that's not really a good idea because yellow attracts bees. And trust me, you do not want bees inside your hummingbird feeder because you're the one that's gonna to have to take the lid out and those bees are gonna be mad. 
And you don't want to be around them when they're like that because that's when they could sting because they have been threatened. So my tip is I have a hummingbird feeder that's red, but does not contain yellow. Butterflies see um, a wide range of bright colors, red, orange, yellow, pink. Flies, which are great pollinators, are attracted mainly to green and white foods. And I remember, you know, at, when I was younger at picnics, all the time we'd have flies all around our food. And you think about a picnic, you know, I grew up where you never had a picnic without potato salad or pasta salad, which we then called macaroni salad. Um, you know, those things are green and white. And then there's the carrion eating flies. They're attracted to things that are maroon and brown. Carrion is basically roadkill. It's dead meat, which is usually maroon or brown. I was giving a talk to a garden club years ago and one lady said that she had bought this big 12 inch lily flower. Of course, she'd bought it off the internet and um, she wanted it where she could see it all the time. So she, her house didn't have a garage. They had a port cochere. And she planted it right by the entrance where her car door was. So that every time she got in and out of the car, she would see this flower. Well, lo and behold, when it bloomed, all she could smell was a dead animal. And she looked around for a dead animal and didn't find one. And you all can guess what her husband's job was when he got home. He didn't find any dead animal either. And eventually they realized that was the aroma being put out by this maroon flower because it needed to be pollinated by carrion eating flies. So it was going to attract them through both its color and its scent. After the blooming season, they transplanted that flower back out to the fence line because it was so big, they could still see it from their windows, but they no longer had to smell it. So here we've got two flowers that I hope you're familiar with. On the left, we've got our state flower, the blue bonnet. On the right, we have a lantana, which are in full bloom now, one of our best plants for the summer in our climate because it thrives on the heat and the dry conditions. So note on the uh, blue bonnet on the left, you know, it has many blossoms from the same stem. It starts blooming at the bottom and goes, newer blooms will be at the top. And those bottom flowers in this picture have kind of wilted. Then the next group of flowers has kind of a pinkish center. And then the ones at the top have a white center. Well, it turns out and this is not scientifically proven, but it's pretty well accepted. This is what's happening, is that once these flowers have been pollinated individually, each little bloom, it turns its center red to signal to pollinators that are not attracted to red that they don't need to come here anymore because there's nothing for them. Whereas bees and lots of animals, insects are attracted to the white. So they want to direct the pollinators to the newer flowers that are still waiting to be pollinated. So they're trying to make themselves invisible to those pollinators that are attracted to red and direct them to the right little blossom to help them reproduce. On the lantana, it is scientifically proven that in the multicolored lantana, which collectively are called the confetti lantanas, 
they bloom first. When the bloom first opens, it's yellow and it comes from the middle of the flower, as like you can see on this example. And then once that individual little blossom is pollinated, then it turns red. And note that the, the flower that's about at the um, 11 o'clock position, note it's got both red and yellow petals on it. That's in the process of changing from yellow to red. And it's all because the plants want to draw attention and attract the pollinators to the flowers that still need the help to reproduce. So another thing flowers use to draw pollinators is they produce nectar, which is sugar water. Here we've got a passion vine flower. And these are just remarkable flowers. And I remember the first time I ever saw them or noticed them was at the um, Arboretum. And I just, everybody that walked by, I stopped them to show them these flowers because they were so remarkable. And at that time, I had no idea how remarkable they actually are. But you see these thin white items. Those are like nectar guides. Those are going to guide any insect, in this case, a bee, going to guide them right to the center of the blossom in that area that's pale yellow and that's where the nectar is. So the bee will walk around that area drinking up the nectar. While she's doing that, any pollen that she has on her back, and unfortunately this one doesn't have any pollen on her back, but this purple spotted structure that's the stigma, the female part of the flower. So any pollen that she has on her back will rub off on that stigma as she walks by. These, and there, note there are three stigmas. And then there's these yellow and green structures. Those are the anthers, the male organ, and they contain the pollen. So when she's finished drinking all the nectar, she's probably gonna rub against one of these anthers on her exit flight from this flower. And that's when she'll get pollen all over her back to carry to the next plant where she's going to drink. So it's a very effective method of ensuring pollination and therefore reproduction for this uh, passion vine. As it turns out, this attracts many kinds of bees, but it needs a specific bee, a passion vine bee, to actually pollinate it. Here we've got some bees inside a datura flower. Daturas are um, Flowers are usually white, although they can be yellowish or pinkish, and they bloom at night and they open at dusk. And you can actually see the petals move to open. So it's very interesting to watch them. And at dusk, bees will stay up late beyond their normal bedtime to come and get the pollen out of this flower. And you can see here how they're gathering pollen and bees gather pollen with their, they have six legs. They use the first two legs to gather the pollen. And in most bee species, then they pack it in to pollen baskets that are on their hind leg pair. And that's what you can see there in the center of the picture, those kind of circular pollen baskets. And so these bees are getting all the pollen they can, and then they'll go back to their hive 
and be unpacked by other worker bees. But it's really fascinating to watch Datura right at dusk where you can see the flower click open and then see the bees come in and get the pollen. Some flowers that offer pollen only, they don't have nectar, are poppies and camellias, also roses, clematis, and begonias. So these are good for bees, but they're not good food sources. They offer nothing to hummingbirds or butterflies. And on the right here, this camellia, I was over at the Arboretum. I lived near the Arboretum, so I used to go there a lot. Now I don't go so often because I prefer more natural settings and more native plants. But I was in the camellia grove one nice day, sunny day in January, and most of the open flowers had one bee on them. And then I noticed a mini swarm of bees. So I walked over that way. It was probably 10 feet away or so. And this flower had just opened. And there was a line of bees to get in and get the pollen. So you see these two bees on the outside and look to the right of the center bee. You see that little black spot. That's a bee inside the flower. And at this point, only one bee can fit in. So this bee in the middle is just leaving and you can see how much pollen she has in her pollen baskets. And the bee on the upper left is waiting to be the next one in. And there were bees all around, flying around and, and then just sitting on stems and branches of this tree and other nearby trees waiting to get in and get that pollen. So they knew where the best stuff was and they were gonna get it and take it back to the hive. And perhaps they would rub some of it off on another flower on another shrub to help the plant reproduce. So there are all kinds of bees. We tend to think of honeybees as being the prime pollinators, and they are very, very important, but they are not the only bees that pollinated, nor are bees the only insects that pollinate. Lots of insects pollinate. So there's over 20,000 described species of bees. And perhaps the most recently discovered unique species was discovered in Central Park in Manhattan in New York City. Not exactly where we think of a lot of nature, but if you've been there, you know that Central Park is a huge park in the middle of one of the world's most crowded cities. These are considered a keystone species. That means they're an indicator of the health of the ecology of that area. So when you see no bees out on plants, you know something's wrong. They deliberately collect pollen to feed their young and they unknowingly move it from plant to plant for pollination. So a very common bee is the European honeybee. It is not native to North America, but it has become an important factor in pollination all around the world. And those settlers that came to Jamestown, Virginia, back in 1607, the first colony of, of Europeans to come to America and settle and survive, they brought their own bees with them. Because, you know, to them coming to, North America was like us going to Mars. We didn't really know what was going to be there. They knew life existed, but it was going to be different than what they were used to. <clears throat> so they brought their bees with them. And now European honeybees are, um, they're a worldwide industry. People build hives for them. They are a 
a business. They're transported around the world to pollinate different crops, and they are hugely important to our daily lives for the food that they provide. California, the Central Valley in California is the biggest producer in the world of almonds. And it takes 90% of the commercial bees in North America to pollinate the almond crop. So, and it's, this happens in March. So it's used the first crop to be pollinated in that large, in a very large way. And it's an indicator each year of the health of the bees. And it's a very expensive activity. About $360 million worth of bees are rented every year for the pollination of the almond crop. About $200 rental price per hive higher than the cost for any other crop to be pollinated, any other crop in the United States. So these are some of the crops that are pollinated by commercial honeybees that are usually transported to an area at a specific time when those plants will be in bloom so that the bees can help pollinate them. So we see nuts and fruits, vegetables, herbs and spices, a lot of the things that we eat on a very regular basis. But there's also native bees and there are at least 500 species in Texas and they co-evolved with the native plants. So they have a very important relationship. And if you remove the bee, the plants won't survive. If you remove the plants, the bees won't survive. So they've got a very um, interesting relationship. And, but it's very hard to commercially grow native bees. They don't lend themselves to it like the honeybees do. So but they are a great help in pollinating. They make honeybees more productive. And native bees are much better pollinators than the European honeybees. So 200 natives can pollinate as much as 10,000 honeybees. And that's mostly because the European honeybees live in colonies, in nests, and only a small percentage of their bees are out foraging for pollen and nectar. The rest are in the nest doing the other chores to help the hive survive. You know, you've got the queen who goes on her mating flight and then is mated enough times to lay tens of thousands of eggs over a five year period of her life or so. And you've got all these house bees, they're called, that perform the different tasks. You know, a hive is really like a maternity hospital. And so you've got the nurse bees, you've got the bees that take the pollen out of the forager bees, um, little pouches. You've got bees that keep the hive at a certain temperature. There takes a lot of worker bees to make that hive function. So a very small percent are actually out gathering the pollen. Whereas the native bees are usually solitary bees. And so they have to find their own food and raise and take it back to their little nesting area and then lay the eggs and, and provide the food for those bees to go through their stages and become adult bees. But bumblebees do have colonies and do have worker bees, but all the other native bees are solitary bees, not social bees. 
So the bumblebee is a very important pollinator. And here we can see a bumblebee and you can see the pollen basket, that yellow dot down there at about the seven o'clock um, place on the circle. So 60 to 90% of bumblebees pollinate versus five to 15% of the European honeybees. Bumblebees visit twice as many flowers and they can have four times more pollen deposited on them. Well, remember that picture of the honeybee rear-ending the um, bumblebee? Well, duh, of course they can collect four times more. They're four times bigger and they're very furry. So they have a lot of pollen will stick to that fur, whereas honeybees are slick. And so they've got to pack it all in their pollen baskets. Bumblebees have pollen baskets as well, but they also will have a lot of pollen just in the fur of their bodies. Bumblebees can work twice as long due to better tolerance of cold and wet weather. And Honeybees are divas. You know, they've got to have all the conditions have to be right for them to leave the hive. Whereas honeybees are, they're out in the rain, they're out after dark, they can go to higher altitudes and colder temperatures. So there's lots of areas that will never attract honeybees. But the native bees, especially bumblebees, can be there to pollinate those plants. Bumblebees also do something which is called buzz pollination. And they can vibrate their bodies to a certain resonance that will trigger the flower to re release the pollen. And so they have a very symbiotic relationship with that flower that will only release its pollen to that particular vibration. And some of the uh, foods that we eat are um, use this buzz pollination. They might not do it exclusively, but bumblebees certainly help pollinate these crops. So we've got tomatoes, cranberries, kiwis, and uh, strawberries and blueberries. One day when I was giving a talk on an unrelated topic, not on pollinators, um, this fellow in the audience asked me, why didn't they tell him when he bought his tomato plant that he would have to hand pollinate it? You know, and I, I thought for a minute to get into that, into the pollination mode. And then I said, you said tomato plant, you only have one? He said, yes, just one. And I said, how many other flowers do you have blooming in your yard? And he said, none. And I said, that's why you have to hand pollinate. You've got nothing that's going to attract the pollinators. They might not see your one tomato plant, but if you had a yard through full of blossoms, they would be coming in and then they would see your, pollen, your tomato plant and you wouldn't have to hand pollinate. So, you know, there's more is better when it comes to pollination. The more flowers you offer, the better chance you have of getting any particular one to uh, reproduce and produce fruit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, squash have their own particular type of bee. Many bees are specialists in that they only go to one kind of plant. And squash bees are ones that kind of break the rules. They fly before dawn, and that's when they're pollinating those squash flowers. You might see other bees on them during the day, but those are not the pollinators. They need the squash bees to pollinate them. There's the blue orchard bees. These um, are specialists also. They usually live to pollinate only one 
type of tree and their whole lifespan as adults exists during the time when that tree will be blooming. So they use them a lot for cherry trees and those bloom during a particular <coughs> Excuse me. Particular season and the that those bees live only during that season. And they will collect enough pollen and nectar to feed the eggs they lay. And then they'll die. So they will go out and pollinate these plants during their very short lifespan. This is a leaf cutter bee, I believe. And this is on a butterfly weed plant, uh, Asclepia tuberosa. And I watched this bee stayed on this plant for 45 minutes one day. And I found 11 other species of insects that I could tell were unique from each other. I couldn't tell you what they all were, but by looking at them, you know, they were all different species. So this is a wonderful uh, plant for nectar. It turns out it takes a sp specific bee to pollinate it. But this leaf cutter bee, they don't have the pollen baskets like most bees do. They have, they put the pollen on the underneath side of their abdomen and you can see it here behind the wing. But this time it's getting nectar. So leaf cutter bees cut out portions of leaves, duh. And many people get upset when they see this on the plant, but don't let it bother you. These bees cut out these little round circles is how they create separate cribs, so to speak, for their babies. And they're gonna use something that's a tubular opening and they will put these round leaf portions between each egg that they lay. If they cut out an oval portion, they use that to line that little chamber. So maybe they would need two or three of the ovals for each egg chamber, and they would need one round one. So that if you think of them like hot dogs, you know, the, the round ones are the ends and the oval ones are the casing around it. And so they'll put the little round circle to enclose their egg to which they've added nectar and pollen to feed that through its larval stages until it's going to emerge as a bee. Here's a fig wasp, and they have a very particular life style, so to speak. They lay eggs while they're pollinating inside of a fig plant. Sorry for my cat. That's just what she does. Um, so they have a very unusual way of reproducing to actually lay their eggs inside of the plant that they're pollinating. So we know that the Eastern, the European honeybee colonies have, they're at about a 40% die off rate each year. And there are many reasons for that. And um, beekeepers are working on it. You know, back in the um, like 15, 20 years ago, I think it was 2006 when they recorded the first occasion of colony collapse disorder. 
and it took them years to figure out what was causing it. At one time, they thought it was cell phones, um, but that turned out not to be the prime reason. It was stress on these bees. And now they know that there's a lot of reasons for this die off and it's all to do with the health of the bees. And the beekeepers are doing a better job of feeding them, especially because in the off season, in the winter, beekeepers were feeding their bees corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, the same product that we have in a lot of our foods. And we know that's not a healthy product for us or the bees. So beekeepers now know they have to feed them something more uh, nutritious. There's also insects and mites and bacteria that can get into the hives. And beekeepers now know a lot more about all this and um, can prevent it. But the wild bees are also dying off and they can't be replaced. So, we have to help them survive and reproduce. So how can we help? We can avoid spraying pesticides. And by that, I mean insecticides. We all have neighbors who have the exterminator out every month. They've got the mosquito systems that emit pesticides on a scheduled basis and Yes, those might kill the pests and mosquitoes, I'll admit, you know, I'm sure they have some benefit to life, but mostly for us, they're an irritant and we don't like being bit by mosquitoes and we can get very serious diseases from them. But we've got to be careful. If you need to get rid of one pest, you need to be very careful what you do or you'll get rid of all the insects. And we don't want to do that. So one thing we can do is replace some of your lawn with and exotic plants with clusters of native and old variety plants. And you can provide flowers year round, not just in the summer. Um, you can join these organizations, millionpollinatorgardens.org, Bee City USA. There are many others. But there is a big effort in North America to do the things we need to do to help all the bees survive. You can create a bee lawn. And you know, in the spring, a lot of times in a lot of yards, it will look like this and there'll be a lot of these little lavender flowers. These are henbit, and those are a short lived cool weather grower that is providing food, pollen and nectar to bees in the cool weather. They're very beneficial to our pollinator population. And they really do no harm to your yard, to your lawn because they're cool weather growers and they're gonna die naturally. But if you listen to all those commercials, you think you've got to put out weed killer to get rid of them. And you don't really need to. You'd be doing a big service if you would let these grow and let these insects get food from you. Another one is dandelions. And in this country, dandelions is a four letter word spelled W E E D. And the definition of a weed is a plant where someone doesn't want it growing. And to many homeowners, their lawn is a place they don't want dandelions growing. But in reality, those first settlers that came to Jamestown that I mentioned earlier and brought their honeybees with them, they also brought dandelions. Dandelions are not native to North America, but they are an excellent food source for bees and for for humans, bees can get the pollen and nectar. Humans eat the foliage. It's a superfood, just like kale. So I know I welcome dandelions in my yard. My yard doesn't have grass, 
it has plants. And so I don't, you know, I treasure them and I let them grow. And yes, I'll admit it, I still act like a little kid and take that puff ball of seeds and blow on it because I want to encourage them in my yard because I know in the yard surrounding me, they're not going to be there. And those bees need to eat. They need to gather food on those nice warm sunny days we have in the winter. So let your dandelions grow. So pollinators are essential for plant reproduction. Their population is dwindling due to the use of pesticides and destruction of natural habitat. I'm giving this talk in Dallas, Texas, need I say more about the destruction of natural habitat? I mean, we're one of the fastest growing places in the world. We have paved paradise and put up a parking lot. Um, so we need to help them survive. Plant your native and old style plants. Don't buy those hybrids that are in the big box stores and many of your other nurseries. If a plant has a trademark or a copyright symbol on it, that means that it's a hybrid and somebody developed it specifically for certain characteristics. And most likely it does not provide any food for pollinators. So avoid buying those. If they're a plant you love and you just can't live without, fine, you know, you can have some, but be sure you have other plants, especially native plants for all our native insects that are so essential for us. Um, this is just something for you to read. We tend to not pay attention to things we don't have to pay for, but we need to pay attention to the bees and the other pollinators. So at this point, um, I would welcome any questions. And I'll stop sharing my screen. So, Let's see what's in the chat. Yes, I was just going to point out the one in the chat. It looks like um, Grace asked, are there four or five perennials that can be planted now that are good for pollinators? Oh, there's so many of them. Um, the one behind me here, uh, Black Eyed Susans, um, Purple Cone Flowers, all the sages. Sages are wonderful for the pollinators. Um, Lantana that I mentioned, um, Datura. But I will say that this is the worst time of year to plant. Summer is not a good time to plant. And especially we've had early high temperatures this year. And I have stopped putting anything in the ground. And it's like we kind of missed our planting season because we had such a late spring. You know, it stayed cold. Then we had those terrible winds where you just didn't want to be outside because it was so windy. And then all of a sudden it's hundred degrees. And so we've missed a lot of our planting season, but roots won't grow if the soil temperature is over 85 degrees. And that usually happens when our lows don't go very low. You know, if our lows, if our highs are 100 and our lows are in the 70s or the 80s, the soil is going to get hot. And so it's very difficult for plants to grow and thrive when you plant them in those situations. And they require a lot more water. And another thing, I'm big into drought tolerant plants and all those ones I named are drought tolerant, but they still need water when you first plant them. So. Our next planting season will be the fall. And unfortunately, there's not as much selection of plants at that time. But um, I would say as a group, the sages are a wonderful pollinator plant. You've got your autumn sages, which are little shrubs. You've got 
and they come in a variety of colors. They attract all the pollinators, bees, butterflies, hummingbirds. Yuccas are great ones as well. The lantanas that bloom in the summer. And um, here we've got black-eyed Susans. Greg's mist flower is a wonderful one. Bees love it and the monarchs love it. It is one of the two essential plants for us, for the whole country to have for the fall migration of the monarchs, which occurs in our area, usually in October. And the plant actually, it attracts the male butterflies because it has a chemical in its nectar that is got medicinal value. So when those males later, in the case of monarchs, it would be next spring, mate with the females, they pass that medicinal benefit to them. Could you repeat that? Repeat that one again. What is the it's name of the flower? Blue mist flower. Blue mist. Okay, thank you. It's um a little. It makes clusters of little furry type lavender flowers, and I just think of it as Viagra for butterflies, and the bees love it too. Um, and another one that's essential for the monarch migration is frostweed. And that's a plant that usually um, blooms in the fall, in October, it has white blooms and it will be covered in butterflies and bees. They both love it. And it's a great plant for them to stock up on food for the winter. And for the monarchs in particular, it's like Red Bull for them. It gives them a lot of energy and they need that energy in order to finish their migration down to the mountains uh, west of Mexico City. Another great one for the fall is um, fall asters. They're lavender flowers and they'll bloom in October. The plant will be covered in them and those flowers will be covered in bees and butterflies. So those are ones that you can find especially in the fall, because people don't tend to buy plants that aren't blooming. And so like the fall asters only bloom in the fall. So it's hard for retail sources to sell them in other seasons. So they'll be a great one to, you'll probably start seeing them. Well, they'll be blooming in October, but maybe you'll see them in the stores and at the end of the summer in August and September. Um, somebody's asking, do I recommend getting seeds for native plants? It's funny, I have to admit, I don't, I start from transplants. I came to gardening late in life and I'm too impatient to wait on a seed. But yes, yeah, seeds are effective. And um, you know, there's North American Seed Company, is that what it's called? Native American Seed Company in Junction, Texas. And they're a great source of native plants. They only grow natives. And um, you should go on their website if you aren't familiar with them and ask for them to send you a catalog. And it's like a booklet and it has a lot of educational information about it. And they have lots of, they're very specific about where plants will bloom and they've got mixes for different, um, the different biomes in our area. So they're very helpful. Um, okay, where can you see pollinator gardens from Joe Lynn? <laughs> Thanks for asking that question. Um, there's a number of great pollinator gardens. And uh, the first one I'll mention is the one I'm in charge of. And at the bathhouse at White Rock Lake on the um, east side of White Rock, and those are, we have pollinator garden there, an oval one in the parking lot right in front of the building and on each side of the building on the lake side. The lakeside gardens are new. And unfortunately, a lot of the perennials didn't come back and it was too windy to work out there in the spring. So we didn't get to plant replacements and now it's too hot. 
So we've got some empty spots in those gardens, but they are full of good pollinator plants. Um, another great one is at Brookhaven College. Um, it's on the trail on the Valley View side of the college. So it's on the um, Southwest quadrant of the college. Um, the Texas Discovery Gardens is a wonderful place to go. They're famous for their pollinator gardens. They're the first um, certified organic public garden in Texas. If you know that I haven't mentioned the other big garden at White Rock called the Arboretum, I wouldn't call that a source of pollinator plants. They're into beauty and it's a gorgeous place, but they're not planning for the pollinators. They're planning for the people's visual, um, for people to, to love it. So I don't use that as a good source. And there's, Many other gardens. Um, a good one is at the Harry Moss Elementary School. It's in um, Lake Highlands. There's one out at the Anne Frank School. But any of your native prairie areas too, we've got them at White Rock, we've got them at Moss Farm, um, out at the Frankfurt Prairie, off of Frankfurt in the Tollway at a little church. Those are usually great areas for pollinators and they're most their native plants. Joe Lynn, if you can suggest some others, please do. Any other questions? Oh, where to find native plants. Um, you know, we're kind of going into the, um, well, the deep summer and most nurseries are having their summer sales because it's frankly, you know, not a great time to plant. But great sources of natives are um, the Texas Discovery Garden plant sales. And in reality, you can shop there any weekday but they have these sales, a lot of sales through the years. It's worth getting on their mailing list. The Discovery Garden's a great place, but they are a, probably our best source of native plants. And most of them are propagated right there on site. So you know they've never had any systemic pollen, um, pesticides, which is very important. Another one in our area is North Haven Gardens. They have you know, quite a few natives. Um, Rooted In, which is a new company that was formed by the staff that used to be called the Water University at the A&M Research Center out there on Coit Road. And it's been almost two years ago since that department was dissolved and discontinued by A&M. And the whole department four or five of them formed their own company called Rooted In. And it's Daniel Cunningham and Patrick, I forget Patrick's name, but, um, you know, well, they were wonderful sources of information, wonderful speakers, gave great talks on a lot of uh, topics in the gardening world and um, rain barrels and things like that. and. And they're very interested in natives. And they now have a nursery out in um, Pilot Point. So it's about an hour from Dallas. And they're having their sale. They're only open Thursdays through Sunday. But, um, you know, Google them, rootedin.com. They're a good source. Um, and there's a number of nurseries in Fort Worth that are really good. I like Weston Gardens has a lot of natives, but there are several others. In Denton, there's um, the Painted Flower Farm, which is a nice nursery. It's on um, 380, just west of 35, you know, like a quarter mile west. Um, they're a nice uh, place. And your native plant groups, like the Native Plant Society of Texas, 
typically have spring and fall plant sales. And now that there's been a revival of the native plants and prairies day, and I hope that will be offered again next year, the first Saturday in June at the bathhouse at White Rock, um, that will have a lot of native plant sales. Have, um, the Native Plant Society will be there. Randy Johnson usually comes. The Texas Native Conservancy, CIC, a newer group was there also selling native plants. So, and in the surrounding counties, um, you can, they have plant sales at the Herd Museum in McKinney for the Collin County Master Gardeners. And Tarrant County Master Gardeners have um, great plant sales as well in the spring and the fall. So those are good ones to look up. Um, do I know anything about the Paul Quinn College Garden? No, I don't. But Grace, do you know about it? Would you like to tell us about it? I don't know anything about it really. I went to um, a block party they had on campus about two weeks ago and they had a lot of lo good looking vegetables. I think they are, um, what do you call it when they don't use any kind of pesticides in that? Oh, kind well, well, you might call them organic. I guess organic. They're an organic garden. I've heard about it for many years, but I've never gotten a chance to go and check it out. Another good um, a garden of you know of edibles is um, Botton Farms, which is down um, right by the Great Trinity Forest, it's off of. Um, Metropolitan there in South Dallas off of 175, off of Bayar Street. It's gotten a lot of press, so you can uh, Google that, Bonton Farms. It's created a great um, food source in a food desert area. Any final questions before we wrap up today's session? Okay, I think it looks like you answered all the questions, Janet. And thank you very much for this presentation all about pollinators. I know that I learned a lot. Well, good, that's what I like to hear. And, um, you know, I love spreading the word. And so I encourage y'all to spread the word as well. That's how you learn is by teaching. So share what you've learned today. And thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And just so that everyone is aware, I want you all to know that our next Master Naturalist present will be, um, it will be held online as usual, and it will also be live in person from the Central Library as a part of our Nature Expo. So we're gonna have different organizations come out to the library here in downtown Dallas to just interact with the community, get to know you, and we'll also be having a Master Naturalist present talk. So if that's something that you'd like to come out and be a part of, that will be on July 23rd from 11 to 2. If you just want to view it from home as normal, we will be streaming it as well. Alrighty, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you again, Janet, and we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you. Bye. <laughs>